Well, it's wonderful to be here. And I will add, too, I'm going to try to earn my grade back here, Brian. <laughs> so we had to cancel last spring. I felt horrible about it, because we really did think that we were going to be finished at that point. Uh, but what Brian didn't realize until he just asked me two minutes ago is that we actually had the first national release of the findings at Vanderbilt yesterday at 1 p.m. The research team, Brian, kept on going, Matt, why, are you, you know, why do we have to get it done? Why do we need the report this way? And I hope we can edit this part of the video so it doesn't sell me out here. Uh, but I just said, you know, it's time to get it done. We figured it out. And, but it was really because I couldn't cancel on Brian twice. Uh, so I hope that will at least get me a quarter point back. The, the real agenda for today, at least uh, from my perspective, is, is to talk about the design and implementation, uh, some of the threats to validity uh, in terms of the experiment in which we are conducting, uh, to go over findings, uh, which are quite interesting, uh, maybe contrary to what some advocates thought, uh, and many expected it in some lights. And then to see how this fits within the general policy arena. Is anybody else getting an echo a little bit? Maybe if I move over here. In terms of design and implementation, uh, we, we kind of have to take a step back into 2004, 2005 timeframe, uh, because the way in which this experiment was set up is we implemented the project. We had negotiated for two, three year period. When it was implemented, part of the, part of the negotiation uh, for, for the project to launch was that we wouldn't talk about results. We, we, we wouldn't do any analyses until full implementation was completed. Full implementation to us meant that that final check went through payroll services and we were done. And uh, no matter how many people asked us, we really didn't look at any outcome analyses except for calculating the teacher uh, effect estimates in order to distribute bonuses in those uh, Final payments went out in November. We then launched into the last nine months or so, uh, trying to, to figure out what the story is within the data. At the beginning of 04, 05 timeframe, the focus of pay for performance, and particularly for advocates of pay for performance, were saying, we have this great thing now. It's called value added. All we need to do in, in order to approve teaching, and I'm simplifying this quite a bit here, is to offer a significant financial incentive, which we've never done. Most pay programs implemented prior to uh, 2005 had a maximum bonus amount of about 3,000, and even 3,000 in many respects was on the high end, uh, and that we, we need to tie the performance standard, the performance measure, to something that's objective. We can't just have prof professional development or somebody come in the classroom and give you a check mark. Uh, in value added, in a sense, brought this to the table. At the same time, there's reports coming out on surveys of Fortune 1000 companies. Uh, that from 1987 until present had increased sixfold in the number of their employees whose performance bonus component was based upon an individual level. Uh, so, so these things were informing the project. And, and I think it's important to say at the same time that when we designed this project, this isn't a project that we, we would think we would implement in practice, right? Uh, this isn't the, the optimal solution. Uh, we're trying to answer a policy that had been de debated in many regards since uh, the 1860s. We can go back and see superintendents quoting and saying, pay for performance is the way to go. Uh, and, and all through the 20s, in the 20s there were some sort, sorts of pay for performance programs. Uh, 1921, the single salary schedule comes in which compensates teachers based upon years of experience and degree held. Uh, by 1950s, 90, over 95% uh, of all school districts in the United States were operating the single salary schedule if we use this to the 2002 schools and staffing survey, again, 97% of teachers were paid off the single salary schedule. Uh, and in fact, if we weight that by the teacher estimates, it goes up to like 99.5%. It's, it's important to remember too within this project that there's, there's different types of pay for performance programs or there's different theories that's driving behind it. We're testing what people are gonna call the behavioral or motivational aspect of it. Uh, many av advocates of pay for performance are going to say uh, uh, a financial incentive will cause teachers to work harder. Uh, I think teachers, uh, quite personally, work very hard. Uh, but it may encourage teachers to try something different that they hadn't in the past. The other piece is the selection or compositional effect. So those who are most likely to be rewarded under the metered activity are likely to come into the profession. And those who are most likely to be rewarded are to stay in the profession. Uh, as well as those who do not receive an award, it sends a strong signal either to improve practice or potentially find other opportunities. 
Of course, we test the, the, the motivational aspect. So uh, the project was called POINT, the Project on Incentives in Teaching. Uh, it took place in uh, Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools, which has about 72,000 students, uh, 125, 130 schools. Uh, we, we were based in middle schools, grades five through eight. Uh, there's of uh, the, the individuals who were eligible to sign up, 296 teachers signed up. Uh, that was about 70% eligible. We had at least one control and one treatment teacher in 38 of the 40 middle schools in Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Uh, and that was just in the first year. As I'll, as I'll show later, we had quite a bit of, implement, of uh, attrition. It implemented for a three-year period, 06, 07 to 08, 09. Uh, and teachers could earn up to a bonus of $15,000. The average teacher salary in the district is roughly around 42. And that's uh, per year. So we just randomized at the beginning of the project. I want to show this because uh, a, a fear of mine in terms of the results coming out is, is there's two sentences to the story, and it's potential that media only get the first. And the first, uh, which I'll tell you in a bit, uh, the, the second is that pay reform can come in many, many different structures. We can conceptualize an incentive program in many, many different ways. Uh, this is a taxonomy we developed for a project we did for the OECD, but you can see incentive structure, you know, comparing a, a, a rank order tournament to a fixed price contract, unit of accountability, we could think of a hybrid system where we're rewarding individuals and teams. Uh, what are the standards and thresholds? Is it going to be linear? Is, are we going to talk about some step function? Again, all of these could play, uh, could play a role in whether they have an effect or not. At the beginning of the experiment as well, uh, I should say that, that this was just not, uh, you know, Va Vanderbilt and Rand and a, couple, a team of researchers moving forward and saying, we want to do this, and a superintendent saying, all right, go ahead. Uh, it, it took a roughly two and a half years of negotiations uh, that included uh, getting buy-in and support not only from the superintendent, the school board, uh, from the local public education foundation, from the business community, from the mayor, uh, but also a key partner throughout all this was the Metropolitan National Education Association, so the Teachers Association, both at the local and the state level. When reporters would call and say, you know, how did you get them on board? Are, are you really being serious about this? They were key players. Uh, and it really came down to the executive director of the Tennessee Education Association uh, making a, a statement during one meeting, and he goes, we just want to know. He's like, it's been too long. We just want to know whether this is an effective policy to increase student uh, test scores. Other things that, that uh, were laid out throughout the negotiation process is that uh, Teachers couldn't compete against other, each other, so we had a fixed price uh, contract. Obviously, this gives us a, a pretty big financial exposure. Uh, awards would be made to individuals, not to teams. And, and we actually see something that's quite cr contrary in practice in other places. But, but Metro was very specific to say, we do not want a vote of 70% of teachers saying yes to have to make those other 30% participate. Uh, and so they let us uh, implement it at the individual teacher level. We're going to evaluate performance based upon uh, a gain score, or uh, their, excuse me, their, their progress over time. Uh, in the performance thresholds to earn a bonus, this was uh, a difficult one to determine, but obviously with a fixed price contract, we didn't want them so low that if everyone got above the bar, uh, we would go bankrupt, essentially. Uh, we also didn't want them too high that they uh, you know, w would almost demotivate those who had no chance at all to reach them and maximum bonuses were large, and, and, and hopefully uh, that's pretty clear. We developed, in terms of trying to figure out what the standard was, what's the performance threshold in which a teacher had to meet in order to earn a bonus, uh, we took three years of prior data. We calculated a very simple, transparent, uh, value-added measure. I'll explain that in just a bit. We looked at what the point estimate was at the 80th percentile, which was about 3.7, at the 85th percentile, and then the 95th percentile. And that's how we arrive at these five, 10, and $15,000. This was also important to the district and to many involved because it, this was, it was fixed for the rest of the time, for a three-year period. So essentially, teachers could improve over time. 
At the beginning of the following school year, they all received a teacher bonus report that clearly explained and outlined, you know, how they performed relative to that benchmark um, in various documents that we provided. So in, in terms of the bonus formula itself, one thing that we, we encountered was uh, in this, when we submitted the grant in probably in 05 and, and we heard in the spring of 06, is we were told that every teacher, for the most part, in middle school who teaches math just teaches math. When we received the data, and we, had, we basically started in uh, July of 06, we had to have this implemented in September of 06. Uh, there wasn't much time. Uh, we found actually the great majority just didn't teach math. And so the way in which we were conceptualizing a, uh, the performance measure in order to calculate bonuses could leave a lot of room for opportunistic behavior in, in uh, gaming. And in that sense is if I teach 50% math and 50% English language arts, am I just going to teach 100% math because I can now earn uh, $15,000? So what we did is created a bonus formula uh, that would actually uh, adjust downward if a teacher's students didn't perform in a non-math subject at the average level of performance within the district for that school year. So basically what we did here is, is, is if we say that a teacher earns 10, it has hit the 85th percentile of performance, uh, obviously uh, we would have I subscript M1 be one, I M subscript two be one, that's gonna get us to 10. Uh, PED is gonna fix it to say that this teacher had 100 students, 75% of them were in, uh, we could say were in math, 25 of them were enrolled in which one's uh, English, uh, and they didn't make it. So essentially then we adjust it to that. They get 75% of the 10,000. That one is not progress, but rather level? This would be, this would be district average progress. Progress, okay. Yep. And, and it came up quite a bit actually that that uh, adjustment took place, although there wasn't drastic uh, drop. In terms of the performance measure that we use, again, I mentioned we use a simple transparent value added measure uh, that I'll walk through uh, right now. The, we, uh, as everyone I'm sure knows here, Tennessee has TVOS. It's existed since about 1995. TVOS reports come out. Uh, the only individuals who can access, at least as of the time we implemented this experiment, were uh, the, the superintendent, the principal of the school, uh, and a designee of the school board. TVOS data comes back to the state of Tennessee in individual sealed signed envelopes. Right, so we're making good use of our data here. Uh, when you open up a TVOS envelope, you get a single page piece of paper. It has about, it has a somewhat of a table on it, 10, six numbers. The most information is a, is a disclaimer at the bottom, that's a paragraph, saying what these numbers shouldn't be used for. For the most part, uh, I don't think teachers ever saw these numbers. Uh, and in fact, throughout the experiment at one point, we had a teacher call who, uh, at near tears, I mean, we, we have interesting phone calls throughout the experiment, but near tears and said, I always thought I was one of the highest performing teachers in the district. And she had around a negative 27 on a, a very simple measure of value added, which put her about in the second percentile of performance. She had been a teacher in the district for 15 years. TVAS had always been there but it's now this translation of this information that seems to put something in that she reached out to us to say, what can I do to become better? Uh, obviously, as researchers, we don't want to interject and, and train, but we pointed her to the math mentors and back to the district uh, so she could get the necessary help. In terms of our measure, it's as simple as this. Please note these are fictitious names, especially if anybody is here from the IRB. Um, <laughs> see, people like academic jokes. This is good. Uh, Jay Smith is actually a person who used to work with the center, so, so we made him our example. Uh, it, and Jay Smith, the way we calculate this, scored a 250 on the math TCAP in 2006. We could say that he was a fifth grader at this time. We would then say, we would then have to wait until summer, and the state would calculate for us every single student in fifth grade who had a 250 in 2006, what did they score in 2007 on average? 
and that's the 270. I would say the expected gain is going to be 20 points. And in this particular case, Jay Smith did very well. Uh, he scored a 285, which we could essentially say uh, is going to be a, uh, 15 points above, uh, 15 points value added. That's what you get in the final, oh, wrong button. That's what we get there. We do that for every single teacher uh, that is enrolled, or every single student that's enrolled in a teacher's classroom from the, continuously enrolled from the 20th day of school until the time of spring TCAP testing. We chose that definition because it aligned with uh, the state's NCLB policy, uh, and we didn't want to design a system that went against with the structures that were already in place. This breaks down for everyone the bonus awards by year. We start off with, uh, in 0607, we have about 143 treatment teachers. And the first thing you'll notice is we end up with 84 in 2008-09. We had a significant amount of, uh, of uh, attrition, and I'll show you in just, just a moment where those individuals tended to go. At the same time, it's pretty clear that each year we range between 40 and 44 teachers are earning a bonus. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, some may think that, that, that something could be happening here. On average, we spent right around nine to $11,000 was the average bonus. We paid out uh, 1.27 million over the period of three years. We had spent weeks and weeks and weeks before we implemented this project, and we projected there's no way it's going to go over 1 million. Uh, and you know, going into year three in the spring and, and already uh, having talked to most of the major uh, foundations across the U.S., and we, you know, we're kind of doing transatlantic flights at this point as well, uh, they weren't interested in supporting teacher bonuses. They wanted to either do the, uh, the research or the program being implemented, but not teacher bonuses. We were very fortunate that the individual who put up the money for the bonuses was also promised to be our financial backstop, and he covered the rest. And so I'm very, very, very indebted to him. The piece in, in throughout the project that, that has uh, been incredibly helpful, as, as I'm sure many in here know, is that, that district data systems are not built around performance management, nor are district data systems warehouses in which all the information from HR, from federal programs, uh, from special programs, whatever it may be, is kept in one place. Uh, nor is it the case that it's kept in the same type of uh, information management system. We were fortunate to hire uh, somebody who was in Metro Nashville Public Schools as a director of data quality and assessment, uh, who actually was a graduate of Vanderbilt, to work 75% time for the center. And, and his sole, well, he would say his sole purpose was uh, to charge forward and help us get access to the information that we needed in order to, to gain as much information that we could to track and, and to get the data as accurate as possible. The best part is that his last name's Pepper, and he is a doctor. Um, <laughs> our response rates and surveys that we gave in the fall and spring, uh, we had a, uh, between 92 and 100 percent response rate, which was wonderful. In year one, we only administered a survey in the spring simply because of the timing and the amount of uh, effort and where we were in terms of the implementation of the project. Uh, but then we began to also include non-participants, obviously because of IRB reasons. Uh, the 30 percent who never signed up, uh, we weren't able to get approval in time to begin to survey them, but uh, through working with IRB and making sure that we followed appropriate rules, we were able to start surveying them in year two. We also conducted a series of interviews, uh, both at the end of year one and a series of interviews this past spring, uh, just get teachers' perceptions. Uh, tremendous amount of survey data that comes from instruments we used in the past on our own research studies, as well as the Rand Corporation, who is a key partner here uh, in studies as well. And Brian actually uh, has added some things on as well, and it's, it's been great. We have uh, principal perceptions of teacher effectiveness is another thing we did. We asked math mentors who were in the district to, to uh, uh, fill out logs about how often they came in contact with teachers. It wasn't always control and treatment. It was just teachers across the district. Uh, we had teachers take uh, uh, the LMT, and so, so we had a measure of teacher no content knowledge. Uh, and on and on. And the district was wonderful to open all this data up to us, because uh, it, it, it was critically important as we started trying to answer this question. One of the pieces as well is that uh, 
when the private foundation reached out to us uh, in the spring, you said, you know, how do I know you have the right linkages between students and teachers, right? This is the foundation for us to be able to calculate a value-added measure of teacher effectiveness. And we said, well, we have monthly course snapshots. We have, we, I know where every single student is at this date in the month and when a change occurred uh, in this transactional history. And he says, how do you know it's accurate? I said, oh, come on, it's data. Yeah, it's, it's in the system. And so finally, I gave up and I said, how about we do an audit? And he said, that, that's what I was getting at. Um, and so we sent every single year, and this was only to treatment teachers because there was a different incentive for the control teachers uh, and there couldn't necessarily be a, a, a comparable uh, comparison here. We sent them a list of their roster, every single student that was enrolled in their classroom. They were masked uh, by period and who was in their classroom at some point during the year and would not be counted for bonus purposes. What's alarming is that of the 143 rosters that we created in the first year, 55 come back with appeals. The appeals process was then turned over to the district to solve. Uh, oftentimes it had to go down to the site level to figure out whether uh, a particular student transfer was true or not. A lot of times it was inter-school transfers or pullouts or some uh, type of, of special services. But we changed 153 students solely based upon that. The other thing that came up quite often, and it came up in about seven instances in the project as well, is whole classes were matched to teachers that didn't teach those classes. And there's a fantastic quote from the Dallas Morning News about a teacher who didn't receive a $10,000 bonus because of his poor French scores. And, and the quote goes on to say that, that he was very discouraged because he doesn't speak French, nor does he teach French, but he didn't get his bonus because of it. And, and it's simply these data systems uh, that, that we have to be very careful about the weight we put on them. Is states, particularly on a race to the top, move into high stakes personnel decisions, whether it's firing or whether it's rewarding, and it's, the problem is going to be firing. Uh, the first thing that's going to be challenged is the quality of the data and the information in, in which uh, that decision was made. The good news is the data systems became a little bit better and, and we see this go down over time. Quickly, we, we, we randomized, uh, obviously, treat, to get the 296 in the treatment and control. Uh, we stratified the sample into 10 groups based upon a school effect estimate. And then we looked at clusters of teachers. The reasons we did clusters is if we saw variation uh, in, in the scaling also of scores in fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth, special ed, and advanced algebra. There was another piece in here, and it didn't, it, it, it's essentially not, not relevant in the context based about how, how things fell out, uh, but we we're very concerned about cheating or opportunistic behavior. Since we obviously had at least one treatment and one control teacher in every classroom, there was an opportunity that the principal and the teacher could collude, and that they could find out some strategic matching of the best students who are optimal in order to uh, maximize that teacher's chance of getting a bonus. And this, this came up as well, that during the recruitment process, we had uh, three teachers run up. So during the recruitment process, we put uh, trained research assistants in a school for the entire day. We had an FAQ document. They could sign up. Everyone asked questions except three people. They ran into the room, signed up, and my colleague Dale Ballou, who, who uh, has just been an incredible partner on this project, says, you don't have any questions? And if you know Dale, there's just a great look on his face. And they go, no. They go, we, we teach third year ELL students. And they said in year one, they do, oh, you know, they don't do well in the high stakes test. Year two, they don't do well in the high stakes test. But by year three, when they're picking, you know, when they're picking up the language, they get the mastery, they're used to the test, huge gains. And they're like, we're taking home $15,000. <laughs> they didn't, is what we learned. Uh, but anyway, it was a good story. There's really, when we talk about threats to validity, uh, there's three things we're mainly concerned about. Obviously, randomization failures, particularly with small groups, uh, we may, they may end up not being equivalent. We see this at the grade level. Uh, we don't see it overall. The purp purpose of assignment is the other piece here as well, which I just kind of uh, spoke to a little bit. And then teacher attrition, obviously. Uh, the good news is overall, the treatment and control groups were balanced across a large number of 
uh, student and teacher characteristics. But as soon as, as soon as we go to a, a little bit lower level, particularly the grade level, we start to see some imbalance. In those instances, when, when we estimate the models at the grade level, obviously we put in a, a tremendous number of covariates into the model. Uh, the number of sensitivity tests here, and I don't outline all the tests that we did, uh, were fell into the, a situation where they told the same story. It was actually quite nice to see the same story just come up over and over and over. Uh, there may have been one or two, but by chance, we might expect a little bit of that. We, we asked at the beginning of the, of the experiment that principals run the schools the way they always did. Obviously, we implemented a few weeks into the first, of the, uh, into the first few weeks of the school year, so assignments had already taken place. This was a huge concern for years two and three when they returned, and they knew their principal, and they knew who would be making those assignments. Uh, we also asked that, that the, the teachers who participate in the project not tell whether they're in the control or treatment group. Part of the concern of, of many people involved in the project is that it could break down uh, collaboration, it could cause resentment, uh, and so, so we asked that they did not share this information. And they, they actually, actually signed uh, something saying that they would not share that information. So, so in terms of, of purpose of assignment, and we followed this over time every year, in, I'm not going to go through the numbers, but really we're looking at proportion of students who switch out of a teacher's classroom. You know, are you pushing certain kids out or into your class? Uh, are we looking at, at dropping students with unexpectedly low beginning year performance? Dropping students who have a downward trajectory? And, and, and part of this, we're assuming that a teacher would really go out and try to figure out uh, what the likelihood of a particular student is in terms of they perform incredibly well in year three. Year three is a generic number here. And so we're going to expect regression to the mean. Uh, they do, in a sense, the teachers, in a sense, have some access to this information is with the TVOS data system. They actually do projections. And so this projection information uh, does individual student projections for everyone who's enrolled in that teacher's class. So it's, it, it's uh, it's plausible this could be happening, but it, during this period of time, login rates were very, very low into that system, uh, and we were also able to track in who logged in. So as you see here, we have uh, control and treatment status. School year, three years of the experiment. Following the 2006-07 school year, we lose uh, two and three teachers. If I already announced this once, I apologize, but we only lost one teacher because they asked to be removed. All other attrition occurred because they changed grades and they're no longer eligible under the criteria uh, that we had set forward. Which is quite interesting because everyone, you know, the, the popular media is going to say, teachers do not like pay for performance. You know, they don't want to do any of this. And I, and I think it's important to remember that these things can be done and teachers will remain supportive. Reporters have asked me for the last uh, day now, you know, were you surprised by the findings? And I said, no, I'm surprised that we even made it this far. I mean, we were literally on the edge of our seats well into year three of just whether this would, would, would last. Uh, so part of the larger attrition here in year two is one of the clauses we had is that a teacher had to instruct at least 10 math students in, that were expected to take the spring high stakes assessment. Uh, we didn't have those data and those linkages at the beginning of the project because we we're still in our data negotiation pieces. And so there's quite a few who in the spring, you know, the students take the test, we have the data now we can look at, and they never qualified. <laughs> to be fair, uh, we let them continue in the experiment. They were not bonus eligible that year. Uh, and a number had to drop out because they, they met, I think it was 14, but we can find out the exact number here. And so this breaks down control treatment and reason for attrition. Just kind of the, the, the way we categorize it here is change in assignment versus eligibility criteria. Uh, the two places where we, where we see somewhat of a difference in uh, the N is they either left the district altogether, uh, more control group teachers left the district, uh, and down here we see more treatment teachers left teaching but stayed in the district. Typically they move to an assistant principalship or a principalship, 
uh, sometimes to a coordinator coach type of position. Out of grade was uh, you were no longer in grades five, six, seven, or eight. There's one middle school, I believe, in Metro Nashville that actually has fifth grade in it, but it's elementary and, and a teacher changed and we mistakenly did not know this and so we tried to drop him and he goes, no, no, he's all, all very deliberate here. And he goes, there's fifth grade, that's middle school. So uh, we honored his request. So in terms of evidence of imbalance, there's, there's really three ways we're looking at this, and that's at the beginning, do we see any differences between uh, the treatment and control group? Uh, do we see differences between treatment and control group over time? And do we see differences prior to uh, point being implemented? I, I know there's quite a long list here, uh, but where we do see differences, and I'll get to the, some of the student ones next as well, and, you, and this is only a, a a set of examples of the type of, of, uh, of variables that we were able to collect on teachers. But we did see that, that from year one to year two, that we end up with, with a slightly greater proportion of female teachers in the treatment group, which actually goes against uh, some of the, the survey literature saying that males would be more likely and more inclined to participate in an incentive program. Uh, and we ended up with slightly uh, more, more black teachers remaining in year two. Year three, again, it goes up a little bit higher for female. And then ELL. ELL was the only place in which we had slight imbalance uh, in year one after the randomization. And then uh, year hired, I guess, is by year three. But overall, for the amount of attrition that we went through, losing nearly half our sample, uh, the balance remained in place pretty well. We also throw in a number of control variables just in our models, obviously because of the attrition, a uh, number of sensitivity tests, and again, uh, these are some of the ones that we'll look at. It's important to note here, too, that for things like TCAP scores, uh, these would be the scores from the first year prior to implementation. Obviously, if we use their score during the year of implementation, that essentially could be uh, endogenous with treatment. I mentioned that uh, an, an issue with the randomization is small ends. So as soon as we, you know, we, we randomize on average, we're looking at the average treatment effect, but, but if we start thinking about uh, doing analyses by grade, are we still balanced at the grade level? And you'll see that when we use uh, achievement prior to point, we have slight imbalance here. And as you can see, the size of the coefficient is, is uh, quite similar. So that's what, what exactly is that? That's the, the achievement score, of the incoming achievement score of kids in the classrooms? That would be their... Or their growth or their... That would be their... Uh, normalized math test score for students uh, in the year coming in to fifth grade, they're in treatment control uh, between the two groups. And this actually would be for, so this is seventh grade, so that's going to be their sixth grade score two years prior. So this is levels, right? It's not any sort of... These are levels. So you could take your formula that you used to re make awards and apply it backwards to the data and see if you would have had differences in the probability of winning the... What, yes, and, and we... Right. I'll, I'll show a few charts that we do. The other piece, and now I'm going to earn back my final quarter point here. I do want to make the observation that says, thanks to Brian and Elias. Um, Brian and I actually first met over this project. Uh, I think he was in... Chattanooga at the time, in the great state of Tennessee. And he got my email, I called him, and, and I just said, look, I need somebody who knows how to do this. You're the only one who's ever done it. Actually, you created this, this uh, in your Chicago study, and this, this is gonna be a big ding on us if, if we don't have this covered in our proposal. Brian was, was generous as he always is, and signed up and, and did a lot of the suspicious uh, answer string patterns, as well as looking at different forms of, of particular cheating or gaming. We didn't see any that uh, would alert us to, to having an issue. The other thing we looked at every year, too, of course, was, was the sorting of students, and, and again, nothing came up. 
The only time that, that something did come up, we actually had a teacher call and say, uh, two treatment teachers in my, in my school are cheating. And I'm like, okay, and, and we, we, we had a very systematic protocol of who could talk to treatment teachers. They had a designated line they could call into. It would come to two of us, we would discuss it as a team, have a very systematic formal response back. And, and what she said is she goes, they're planning their curriculum together. <laughs> and, and last time I checked, that was called team teaching. Um, <laughs> so, so we followed up with that in a nice way. In terms of dependent variables, uh, we have TCAP math scores transformed to rank-based z-scores, uh, typical things you would see. Uh, we did sensitivity, te sensitivity tests with the benchmark gain scores that we showed you for uh, calculating the value-added scores. Uh, there's a num number of other things we looked at as well. We also added in reading, ELA, science, and social studies. Another piece in this, too, that, that was incredibly enlightening is, is how English 101 was ballet. Uh, and we were fortunate to audit the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different course codes and course descriptions before uh, we did our first year of calculations. And we were able to set up a, a kind of a protocol in order to consider something an academic subject. Uh, because the, the coding they use often, uh, I can't see ballet with reading. Treatment status, we look at really in three ways, and I'll present these results, and that's just simple, uh, the average treatment effect, one, zero, one being treatment. Uh, treatment status interacted with student grade, so we're looking at whether there's differences uh, based upon grade, as well as treatment status interacted with year, and we only did this when pulled across all years. In terms of findings, uh, we, we did not find a statistically significant effect, an average treatment effect overall. Uh, there, there was essentially no difference between the performance of students in control group classrooms and the performance of students in treatment group classrooms. Years, year pri it would be the year prior to, uh, it would be, yeah, and I can show but if you're in seventh grade, it goes back a couple years. Thank you. Yep. We also found that there was no significant differences for students in grades six through eight uh, when we estimated separate effects by grade. We did find a significant positive effect in fifth grade in years two and three of the experiment. However, when, uh, the stu when students matriculated into sixth grade, we no longer saw this, saw this difference. Uh, and the effect is quite large. It's a half to two-thirds of a year's worth of academic growth. But given that it, it, it does not persist, uh, we feel as though we can't place too much weight on it. The one caveat here is that, and I said at the beginning, we're still waiting for the data to come back uh, from the state. They changed their testing system. It's delayed, we will go right in and look at the same exact thing to see whether uh, the sixth grade, uh, the students in fifth grade last year, their, their uh, effect persists. In terms of teacher attitudes, this is probably some of the bigger takeaways. I think. Um, uh, you can tell me if you're going to talk about this later, but in terms of the achievement. I'm trying to get my points back. Um, was. Uh, what were the overall trends in Nashville at the time? Was there no difference because there was, you know, mm -hmm. significant gain between for both treatment and control groups, or flat for both treatment and control groups, or trending downward? Were you a reviewer? <laughs> uh, it, it's a, it's a critical point here. It's actually the gains in the school district went up uh, quite a bit during this period of time. I cannot tell you why they went up. I could, I you know, we could probably bring up twenty different reasons. Uh, one potentially uh, important thing to note is that in year two, the district was facing state takeover. There's a lot of newspaper coverage about uh, the state takeover. Would it get defaulted to mayoral control? What was going to happen? There's no superintendent. Uh, it, it's potential. You could make the, uh, the argument that the incentive effect from state takeover was greater than what we may have seen from the incentive effect of this monetary award. Uh, we also looked at whether this was true, because it was a pretty large gain, and again, we're normed off the state. So uh, we see this in third and fourth grade as well. So it's just not the treatment grades in which we see that.
we see very few differences in terms of, of teachers' perceptions of different instructional practices, attitudes, how they're approaching their jobs, their positions uh, between treatment and control groups. We do see that, that teachers uh, in, the, in the treatment group were more likely to report some, somewhat of a positive uh, outlook towards their school environment and their principals than the control group teachers were. For the most part, though, there's really no differences that we see over time. Uh, for lack of a better example, but you know, if a teacher said something like, I uh, more, contact parents more regularly, and there was a significant difference between treatment and control. And then the next question said, uh, do you contact, how often do you contact parents? And the next one say, never. Uh, there was no common story, there's really no common theme as we try to tease out what all this information was saying. Now those weren't exact questions, so, but hopefully that's the point. Uh, teachers of all years were generally supportive of the project. They, they, uh, we had no complaints about bonus calculations. We had no challenges that this measure is unfair. Uh, and as one may expect, novice teachers were, were much more uh, likely to, to think that the program was all right compared to veteran teachers. The big aha moment right here, comparison between teachers who did and did not win bonuses, those who won bonuses were slightly more favorable than those who didn't win bonuses. This is a good audience. They, they laugh at my really bad joke. Uh, teachers who won a bonus revealed increases in positive perceptions of the point across years as well. Do you? That's good. That's good. <laughs> that, that's five bonus points, Brian. Uh, 